Hi, my name's Will Billingsley, and so this is uh, Making Education Run Like Open Source. And the first thing I want to do is I really want to stress the ing. This is a, a journey that we're on. Uh, we've, uh, we've made a few steps, as hopefully you'll see, but we're certainly not uh, all of the way there yet. Uh, and it's also, it's a journey where, it's one of those journeys where you don't necessarily know where you're headed when you're making the next step. Um, second thing I should say is, although uh, I'm standing up the front talking and I have a bad habit of saying I a lot, um, this, the, I've been working with a number of other people. Uh, Jim Steele at UQ, Yongi Seuss, you'll hear them during the talk. Uh, some of it's about things we've been doing at the University of Queensland, uh, where the, the particular course takes place. Uh, Nikta, who very kindly let me work on this sort of education stuff while I was working for them as a research engineer and the University of New England, who have been silly enough to give me a faculty position so I can do this sort of stuff there from, uh, from next year. Um, I cut the talk up for this slide a little differently than I described in the programme. Uh, so there's sort of two sides of it that I want to talk about. The first bit is this 200 to 1, 200 students on a project, and the way that the students collaborate with each other. And this is an, an unusual course uh, that has its roots in open source. And the other side from how the students collaborate and work with open source is how we can get teachers and universities to uh, collaborate on education rather than code in terms, of, uh, in terms of open source. And so there's this sort of four to one, hopefully, courses sharing stuff. I'll explain that a little later. So I'll describe the, the project, I'll describe the uh, courses sharing stuff and how that relates to uh, open source. So first of all, 200 students on a project, on a single code base, and I've given this the little tagline, is this the world's biggest single semester student project? Um, the history of it is many years ago, uh, some people noticed that some of the problems in software engineering are similar to the problems in architecture. And so you get things like design patterns, which are a technique borrowed from architecture and then applied across into software engineering. Uh, similarly, in universities, they thought, well, let's have a look at the way they teach architecture students and studio models of teaching, and can we apply those to, uh, to software engineering? And so this model where you'd get students in, say, a group of four uh, working on some particular piece of code uh, over a semester, critiquing each other's work, and uh, you sort of have a class of them working on uh, various different projects. And UQ had a course like this, and the students would each go and pick a, an open source project to work on over the semester. 2011, when Yen Gi, Seuss and I were going to be looking after this course, we weren't satisfied with this. We figured that a lot of the problem, uh, sorry, a lot of the skills, engineering skills that we were wanting to teach around version control, test-driven development, continuous integration, um, you could get away without doing them if you were in a group of four students working on an open source project and the tutor was stretched across all of these different pro projects not knowing what was going on. Uh, we figured that it's when someone you don't chat to every day starts working with your code, modifying your code, that you learn the value of having good tests and uh, having a continuous integration server, building them and testing them, and good APIs, etc. Uh, so we, we came up with what we kind of nicknamed the, the feel the pain pedagogy, where we wanted students to encounter problems that needed the engineering techniques we were teaching as solutions. Uh, what we came up with was put them all on the one code base. Uh, so now there were team, still groups of four, but now they're developing features for a common code base. And so uh, we kind of called it super collaboration instead of collaboration because you've kind of got these two layers of it. You've got the students working collaboratively in their small groups, but then the, the small groups are all collaborating together. And to start with, we took, uh, this was originally for about 70 students, and Initially, we took a project, an open source project called RoboCode, which had some history, and we wanted one that had some history, had some legacy, so students would theoretically refactor issues in uh, legacy code. It turns out it's really hard to get students to refactor. Um, but so RoboCode came out of IBM, and originally it was a thing where you programmed a tank to uh, kind of battle other tanks. But so this was one of the groups turned it into a soccer game, and other ones did um, modern warfare style kill streaks or black holes or teleports, etc. Um, and so for the first couple of years, uh, we ran this for around about 70 students, and 
it works and we saw them hitting things like difficult merges, we saw them having to write tests and encountering many of the problems that uh, we wanted them to encounter. Um, they did have a habit of leaving everything a little bit late. <laughs> um, this was 2011. 2012 wasn't quite so bad, but uh, I, I kind of joked to the class that for the first nine weeks they weren't doing continuous integration and then for a, a week or two they were. Um, 2013, Jim Steele uh, was uh, coordinating this year. I was helping uh, teach the course. And some things changed. The course changed from being software engineering studio to design computing studio because suddenly we had design students as well as software engineers as well as uh, information system students. So quite a varied class. And it also doubled 140 students. And this particular year, we decided each time we'd kind of handed more of the project over to the students. And this time, we gave them a lot less code to start with. And we said, OK, we're building a network games arcade, something a bit like Steam. And so some groups worked on things like the Game Store or the Multiplayer API, or there was an event recording and replay system. Other ones did interesting games that sat on top of it, arcade shooters. Um, this was quite a cool puzzle game that was kind of a competitive version of Dots and Boxes, but you had to go and collect bricks to be able to draw the lines. Um, platformers. And we also introduced a, a critique halfway through, where the students would have to kind of review the other group's prog progress. Uh, no guesses as to where the critique happened in the commit graph. Um, which brings us to kind of what I wanted to talk about a bit hot off the press, which was, so this year, the class grew again, 200 students. Yikes. Uh, and so week 13 was a, a, about a week and a half ago. Uh, so this is, they've just finished this course. And where last time around, the, uh, the arcade, there was, if you like, there was hubs and hub teams and leaf teams. There were teams working on infrastructure that everyone used their stuff. And there were teams building games that kind of sat out and their collaboration was to use the stuff. Uh, this time we decided to sort of flatten it a little bit and we put them onto an, the idea was an open world game. Uh, we gave them a really small amount of code to begin with. So this was, on day one, this was our open world. And so really not much more apart from putting some basics in place so that there's a graphic stuff, there's a server, uh, there's a physics model uh, going on. And so there's a really, really tiny amount of code so that we let the students uh, take charge of a lot of the architecture. But it does give them a high level architecture. Uh, in this case, that there's a game client using libgdx as the, as the graphics library, uh, box2d as the physics library inside that. Um, because it's a multiplayer open world, there's a server that they all talk to, which means that they need to deal with all sorts of concurrency issues. But this is a two-level course, so theoretically second year. Uh, so we don't necessarily expect the students to be very far advanced in understanding it in concurrency. So we put in uh, ACA as uh, being a sort of fairly simple actor model to try and ease them into that. And on the other side, there was a, a, a manager for kind of, you know, kicking and banning players and managing who's on, on the... Uh, the open world, and all of this communicating over Cryonet. So it kind of gives them a, a very small amount, but enough to get started, enough that the first thing that happens isn't we need to wait for someone to decide on the overall architecture. Um, more importantly, we sort of give them the, uh, if you like, the, the production line for the code, uh, where for our students, we, 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 we use Git and we host it up on GitHub, and they're generally programming in, in Java, so we use Gradle, and Jenkins is the continuous integration server, continuously building their code, uh, seeing if it passed all the tests, seeing if it works. And they're, they're, they're editing their code using whichever ID, ID they like, theoretically Eclipse, but uh, uh, IntelliJ has, has nicer uh, support for Gradle projects. And there's kind of a few other things that we kind of hang off this production line. We give the students very much this picture that you've got uh, a whole tool chain that, that you can integrate interesting things in different places to help you do your work. And so one of them we put was Sonar Cube that, uh, that would measure things like test coverage over time, run find bugs on the code, uh, have a look at the, the code quality. I'll talk about code quality in a little bit. We had a problem one of the years that we ran the course where First tutorial session, everyone in the class starts to build the software. And so Gradle goes off to fetch everyone's dependencies independently. And that year, we hadn't got 
ask factory, which is kind of a dependency cache for binaries that your code depends on, uh, set up in time. And the network was incredibly slow, and everyone's first builds took like an hour and a half just to get the stuff over the network. Somewhere there was a bottleneck. We thought we were in a university with, uh, with fast uh, bandwidth, but some, at some point there was a bottleneck. Um, so this time around, we did get Ars Factory in there. And there was something else that we had to do that I think a lot of other projects don't necessarily. Um, last year, students, as well as committing their code, of course, they're also committing various um, media artifacts, images, graphics, sounds. And being students, they end up committing quite a few different versions. And so the repository grew to be well over a gigabyte. And it would be painful to uh, clone and painful to do a, a pull if you had been missing for a few weeks. And so we needed to keep those out of the source code repository. And the, the solution we came up with was have another little media repository and to basically publish them as binary libraries up to Artifactory. It sort of worked. The problem that seems to come up is that the students don't update the version number uh, in Gradle on any of their images. And so everything always goes in as 1.0 snapshot. And so if you roll back the code, it doesn't roll back the images with it because you are still on 1.0 snapshot. And you also get cases where students will, um, they'll, they're generally pretty good about committing their images to the media repository. They're not necessarily very good about pulling other people's. And so they would do an upload archives to, to publish their stuff. And they would overwrite newer versions of their colleagues with the older versions that they still happen to have. Um, so we haven't quite got that bit sorted. OK, that was what we did. What did they do? Um, well, they did this lot. And um, uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but there's some interesting ones. So one of the teams did voice over IP. And they ended up doing this initially in JavaScript, but we thought that wasn't integrated well enough. So they then did it in, uh, in Java, but uh, with everything going through the server. And then for the third checkpoint, they decided, no, 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 let's make it all discover itself peer to peer. So they, 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 they kind of did. Um, quite a lot of work. Bounty hunting, random events, um, that, that's about half of it. There's, there's a bunch more player versus player stuff, infinite dungeons, NPCs, uh, quite a lot. This is a Gorse visualization of who, who knows Gorse? OK, not very many people. Um, it basically visualizes who's been editing what on a repository. So this is the first few days is just the, the teaching staff basically setting up the directories and the project files. First of all, OK, already we've now got students on the repository. And they are creating an awful lot more code than we were. Uh, 12th of August, 14th of August. So this is around about week two or three of the course. In one of the tutorials in, I think, week two, one of the groups was complaining, look, I've done all this code, but the other groups are holding me up because they're not moving fast enough. And it was like, this is week two. Most of the other groups haven't actually formed yet. Some of the groups were very fast out of the gate. Uh, 27th of August, this is starting to approach the first checkpoint. And there's a good proportion of the class is uh, on there editing away. and. Uh, uh, beetling around. You'll see kind of flashes where occasionally the students will do some change that affects a large part of the repository. First of September. So that's the first ch checkpoint along the way. And so things then quieten down a little way. So there's a big rush to get stuff done, ready for the first checkpoint, re ready for the first critique. And then it all quietens down for a bit. And it'll start to approach the second um, uh, the second checkpoint, and one of the things that happened in between, one of the teams moved the physics onto the server. And we had so many students that we couldn't fit them all in the same tutorial room. So there were four tutorial sessions. And they'd spoken to the teams in the same session, but not to the ones in the other sessions. And so the ones in the other sessions uh, suddenly found that the physics had all moved. But it mostly still worked for them. Um, the, the blue ones over here, that was some media stuff going in. And then the students pull it all out because it needed to go into the media repository. Whoa, what happened there? Some students managed to do a, a, a merge hell or something. And it all got rolled back uh, and back to normal. That's around, uh, we're after the second checkpoint now. And this is the run into the third checkpoint, which is sort of towards the end of the course. And you'd expect to be incredibly, incredibly crazy. Um, Eventually, the students did manage to trample each other and kind of end up into the situation where the build's broken and people are committing on top of a broken build and we can't get it back in time for the deadline. 
But that only happened at midnight the night before the deadline. The deadline was 8 a.m. on the Monday. So the last eight hours of 14 weeks of project uh, hit issues with there being 200 students on this project. Actually, the rest of it worked remarkably well. Um, Sonar Cube came up with various statistics. The top one there, lines of code, August the 19th, that's sometime in week three, and that's already mostly student code, 4,000 lines of code. By the end of semester, they'd written 67,000. In terms of the quality, well, test coverage around 22%, unit tests from 15 up to 574, so they were doing some testing. Um, but, as I'll get to a little bit later on, we the thing that we care most about is actually the quality of the student experience, what they've been through and that they've learnt stuff, rather than the product at the end looks beautiful. Um, unit tests, this looks lovely in terms of, that's the number of tests, and it looks nice and linear, but actually um, no guess is where the, the, the three checkpoints were in their Khmer graph. Uh, GitHub's uh, is a little nicer in how it presents it, it smooths out the curve a little bit, um, but interestingly Individual students, because of course they're not full time on the course, they're not working on a, a project like they would in a company, they all have different patterns of behaviour um, that look quite different from each other. So it's when you combine them all that it ends up looking like that. 116 branches, this uh, is already a factor that's a little bit different than how kind of real world projects go. So in a student project, as well as wanting to commit code so it's part of the repository. Sometimes you may want to commit code so that the markers can see it, or because I'm stuck on this, I need to share it with you so you can have a look at it. And so there ends up being a situation that um, actually branches take on a little bit of a different purpose sometimes. Um, but of the commits, around about, well, almost a third of them uh, were merges, which is quite nice, because that's sort of, if you like, on average, there's only, you know, three commits to a merge. Uh, so students were integrating fairly well. It looks quite eclectic. Um, there is some sound, I don't know if you can hear it. But so, that character firing the arrows, that's the player, and we can change his uh, appearance, and... Uh, we can wander outside, and there's breakable items uh, that one of the teams did. We can also go and break some rocks. There's a few kind of unique uh, things. So th this monster that's walking towards me, well, the wolf would go after pets, except that the pets got removed. But that monster's not really a monster. It turns out to be a puppet inhabited by lots of little monsters. They came up with kind of a fake, we we're pretending to be a big monster one. Um, the character just walking through the fire there is a mount. The, the team that did the mounts decided they didn't want any horses, so they'd have zombies instead. Uh, they did all sorts of interesting things with them, except you can't ride them. Um, <laughs> this uh, is zoomed out, uh, so shows kind of lots of the teams to do their features, put on interesting bits, like there's a pyramid that's got a maze inside of it. So there was a certain amount to which teams do find themselves kind of little leaf areas, but for the most part it was uh, integrated together uh, quite neatly. Let's pop into a dungeon. The music changes, there's a mini-map down on the bottom right, and he's going to go and find a different sort of monster uh, hiding in that dungeon. On the manager side, there's sort of various things for going and spawning different uh, kinds of creature. Um, we ended up late deciding to keep the project top down, and so the, the front-on art didn't see a lot of use except in the manager. Uh, and there's log, that's it, pulling up the server logs to show that the manager's also connected through to the server. And always finish with a dragon attack. <laughs> um. Okay, some of the other parts that we need on the course, because we give the students that sort of infrastructure, but there's also kind of a social side of it. How do the students communicate with each other? And generally, this was on GitHub, where the issues were and the wiki was, and the students get on Facebook an awful lot, and the staff don't particularly go on Facebook, but th that's what the students seem to use to communicate with each other. We had these four tut tutorial sessions, each of which had approximately a quarter of the course, and we also had lectures, which I wrote a little bit of open source software uh, called Impressory for, which sort of has four uses. One of them is in a class of 200, I figure no one wants to stick their hand up and say, I don't understand that! Um, and so we kind of let students chat anonymously up onto the main screen. 
Um, but we also wanted to bridge from in class to out of class. And so there it's kind of showing the, the, the lecture with the, with the chat. But there it's kind of more like a Facebook style activity stream. People can just post things uh, uh, outside. And part of the reason for that was I was always quite frustrated that uh, if you go into a bookshop on any given topic, there are hundreds of books. You take a university course and on any given topic, there is one set of slides. Um, I was quite keen on the idea that uh, of how can we get uh, things to be open to contribution as well as being uh, open to pop, uh, from reusing uh, our stuff. And so uh, this was the idea that, you know, the students would be able to post content, we'd be able to get content from elsewhere, etc., etc. Uh, it turns out the chat uh, part was, was quite useful near the beginning. Uh, unfortunately, students don't turn up to lectures very much after the, the attendance sort of drops off. And by the end of semester, you can just talk. Um, and the, uh, generally, one of the things that this suffers from is uh, me writing it in a few moments I have available, and I never seem to get to update it during term. The other one that we ended up needing was, so the students do their critiques. And the way that we came up with for doing this was each student is asked to critique three other groups. But then to make sure that they actually read the critiques, they're asked to assess the critiques their group receives on whether it's useful, objective, understandable, etc. Um, and so we ended up needing to write a bit of software for that, because if you've got 200 students, each asked to write three critiques, that's 600 critiques. But each of those critiques is then reviewed by the four members of the group, so that's 2,400 reverse critiques. So that's 3,000 total critiques per, okay, um, uh, per time around. And so even just for the one course, it was sort of worth writing uh, something like that. Okay, the student work, however, at the moment is in a private repository. And this is a little bit disappointing, because that's not very open. I had these visions that students would be able to, uh, in job interviews, point to, you know, this is what I did. It's, here it is. Um, so what are some of the differences to do with this? Well, one of them is that in a course, uh, it's fairness, not meritocracy. Everyone is a committer. Um, doesn't matter whether a student is an excellent programmer or a terrible programmer, they still need to be able to take part in the course and commit to the project. So it's not really going to work exactly as an open source project anyway, because no one's necessarily going to be able to use it at the end, um, because the students are the product. Um, the other side of it is the, the UQ doesn't own the student's IP. And that's privacy as well as just property. So in the visualization earlier, I had to take all the students' usernames off. Um, uh, and so there's kind of this problem of how can we get students to be able to point to what they've done without breaching each other's privacy. And it sort of feels a bit like you've got all these soldier ants creating these wonderful patterns on a beach, and we end up having to let the tide wash in and over it uh, so that a new pattern can be created next year. Well, one of the things I thought was maybe if we do this as a MOOC, maybe if we do it open to the world, not just for our students, but for the incredible variety of the public, um, that could work. Uh, we modeled for how it could cope with scale and attrition uh, that MOOCs face. And dealing with, at the beginning, the class needs to be able to talk about what it works on, but at the end, it mustn't feel empty. And we worked out that actually it could work, because if you start the project at week three, the attrition comes down to somewhat manageable sizes. And I started putting some stuff on supercollaborative.org uh, with the idea of let's host the thing on GitHub pages. So that way people literally can do a pull request to put stuff into the course, or they can literally fork the course. And I did a talk at a major conference to, uh, about this and kind of had this catchy tagline, are you super collaborative, sorry, cheesy tagline, are you super collaborative because with your help we are, to try and get involvement. And I had an unusual re response, which was, what if my students joined in with your project? Uh, a couple of other... Um, youngish, uh, you know, juniorish lecturers from other universities. And this sort of spoke to me, forkable courses, because, you know, we're already putting this up on, on GitHub, and I'm already going from UQ to UNE, and it's already been done, uh, partly supported by NICTA, so um, can we make that happen? I went to Startup Weekend Education in Sydney. Uh, Will, Sam, Kenny, Devesh, Sergey, uh, we actually hit, and our team named Tweaked was what we came up with. Uh, it turns out we're not the first people to look at this. Uh, Triangle Startup Weekend Education last year, the winning team was Course Fork. Uh, but it turns out they've pivoted. They've decided they couldn't solve this problem, so they're doing a, a, a slightly smaller problem. Um, 
But there's some differences between how we share code and how we share teaching uh, and education. So here, you know, you might fork a project and you might then do pull request between that same family of things that have a common ancestor. Not quite the same for education. There I am at UQ and I go across to the University of New England and, well, to start with, they're, they're kind of more like siblings than a hierarchy because, well, there's, there, there is a class with people in it in both places that, that it's serving rather than uh, there being necessarily an upstream. But also, we might care about things that happen in another software engineering course, even though it's not part of the same family. And um, there's, there's also already kind of sharing models, open educational resources, about how you share an individual lecture or presentation or video. Uh, so we think the sharing model is a little bit different. Um, and I'm hoping to solve that problem. And there's also the infrastructure that goes with the course. How do you fork and get the issues, the Facebook, the studios, the intellectual interaction, et cetera? Especially when some of that might need to be different. UNE, a lot of the students are remote, so we won't be able to get them in a room together. Um, Jim may or may not want to continue with my dodgy teaching software after I'm, I, I've moved. And at UQ, where there's designers involved, well, this is a very codely structure. There's a lot of props for how programmers operate. But what about, where's the equivalent for the designers? Where's the stuff to help the designers know what I'm supposed to do in this course? OK, so take home messages from this. The first two are shameless advertising. UQ students are cool. Hire them. We put them through this uh, terribly feel the pain experience, and they survive it. So they must be good. Uh, the second one, similar vein, UNE students are also cool, and uh, we will be putting them through uh, a, a similar field of pain uh, thing, so hire them too. Um, higher education kind of feels like software in 2005. So everyone is talking about open, the lecturers are all very willing to be open, no one's particularly complained about, oh, you've been producing uh, code while, uh, sorry, teaching content while at NICTA and UQ and UNE. But we haven't got the sharing models there. There's, there, there's not the GitHubs, et cetera, for it. Um, the other one is you see a lot of people wanting to disrupt higher education as if it's big business. And it's, it's really not. Um, it might look like big business when you look at an institution level. But if you look at the courses, at me, Jim, and the tutors teaching our subject, or then just me <laughs> teaching some other some subject somewhere else, uh, it's like a lot of very small, very overstretched nonprofits um, uh, working uh, for our students. So generally, we're kind of heading in the right direction, but it does mean that it's quite slowly. And um, we would like to try and get, um, well, at least I would like to try and get um, the community involved. Uh, so I'm going to stop there because I have a feeling I've overrun the, the five minutes as well and ask if there's any questions. I just, think, just as a starting point, a country like Australia where you've got a, a, a lot of people widely separated geographically, uh, you really need to compensate for that lack of face-to-face -face with um, an array of more than, say, a couple of uh, Communication mediums, and I found Google Groups to be very good like that. Okay. Because you've got that uh, email scenario where some people are asleep, uh, you've still got the messages waiting there for, in the email. Yeah. You know. um, and no, I, I actually wouldn't agree with the, um, the higher ed not being big business because it is. And this is a major selling point uh, that you can bring to the administration. They really need educators. Mm. They really need to be educated because the, the, a lot of them don't understand um, e-education yet. Okay. They're looking at the MOOC phenomenon as a way to cash in, but they're not sure about how to go about it. So what you do is you sell it like this. You say, okay, yes, we've got all the facilities, uh, but we've got a lot of people that can't access that. This is a way whereby you can... Uh, Anyone not here? Okay. This is a way by which... Is it on? Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is a way by which you can cash in. This is a way by which you can triple your student intake mm. without increasing your uh, brick and mortar investment. This is a way by which you can triple your student intake without increasing your real estate potential at all, without increasing your overhead yeah. factor at all. 
Uh, also, here you have, you, these days, there's no need for uh, a conventional um, uh, educational environment. You can have a continual flow through a tertiary educational institution whereby, okay, you've got the same uh, facilities, yep. but the whole spectrum of the community can take them up. You can, you've got uh, sporting facilities. You can have teams coming in and mm. staying in those stay, same dormitories that yep. students are booked into permanently. Mm. They don't need to be booked in there permanently. You can have a rolling population going through these things. Yep. Uh, you can have all sorts of people go, coming in and, and taking advantage of that. But no, um, that's the main point with the lack of face-to-face -face that uh, bricks and mortar has. That's the only advantage. You yeah. must really broaden that... Um, that uh, communication spectrum yeah that's uh, so the top of my mind because next year 80 percent of my students are going to be remote so um yeah. yes <laughs> uh, i don't have a solution to it yet though but we have to end it now, okay so, uh, you can talk over lunchtime thank you i'd love to talk